I am Dr. Noel Novello, and I am a researcher in uh, reproduction and genetics at Kentucky State University's aquaculture program. So today I would like to welcome you to our video lecture titled Introduction to Tilapia Aquaculture. So the learning objectives for this lecture are first of all for you to participate in the activities, both teachers and students. Secondly, we would like uh, you to be able to provide a general and specific definition of aquaculture. List four major categories uh, of species in global aquaculture. Define the term tilapia and tilapia aquaculture. Be aware of local and global aspects of tilapia aquaculture. Be aware of a general reproductive biology of fish known as tilapia. List four methods of producing all male tilapia. List five factors as affecting spawning and reproduction. Identify main components in a recirculating aquaculture system and use resources for learning that are readily available in the internet. We plan to achieve this by using slides and videos to define and illustrate information, uh, present interviews with a seafood manager from Kroger at Frankfort, Kentucky, present video activities on feeding and recirculating aquaculture systems, and involve you in using your imagination in thinking, in responding to questions, presenting um, high school students that work with us in the preparation of this video and that work in the genetics and reproduction lab for a semester or two, and use a fish.j database and other web links for further aquaculture resources. So the data that we're using today a lot of the information comes from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, this uh, slide is showing you the database that I use to generate the graphs and the numbers on global production of, in aquaculture and of tilapia in this presentation. So what is a capture fishery? The reason I want to define this right now is to distinguish it from aquaculture. According to the FAO, a capture fishery refers to the harvest of aquatic organisms that are exploitable by the public as a common property resource with or without appropriate licenses. So in this picture you can see a public resource can be a river or a lake and people fishing with individual fishing lines. However, this capture fishery also includes uh, harvesting from the sea as you can clearly see in this picture, you have a huge cage that is being pulled up in the Bering Sea in Alaska for the harvest of king crabs. What is aquaculture? Let us hear what Gage and Caroline, high school students that have worked closely with us, have to say about aquaculture. My name is Caroline Bramble. I live in Frankfort, Kentucky, and I'm a student at Frankfort High School. My name is Gage Miller. I also live in Frankfort, Kentucky, and I go to Frankfort High School. Aquaculture is the farming of plants, fish, and other underwater organisms for a business or research purposes. I find aquaculture to be very interesting and is a great new way to have an environmentally friendly food source. I think most people think aquaculture is just handling fish all day, but when I came here, I found out that it's much more than that. There's nutrition, genetics, feeding them and everything else. A short definition of aquaculture, actually an extremely short definition, like Gage mentioned at the beginning of his definition, is aquaculture is the farming of aquatic organisms. However, we can extend it to state the farming of aquatic organisms in both coastal and inland areas involving interventions in the rearing process to enhance production. An expanded definition that the FAO gives us is that aquaculture is the farming of aquatic organisms including fish, mollusks, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. Farming implies some sort of intervention in the rearing process, such as regular stocking, feeding, protection from predators, individual or corporate ownership of the stock being cultivated. What is global aquaculture? 
based on these broad categories, we, we can understand that if we have 567 aquatic species being cultured, this is a huge global effort and a huge endeavor. This graph shows that aquaculture in the 1950s was minimal. In 1970, the total production of aquaculture in terms of millions of ton was 3.5. By 1995, there was a total production of 31 million tons. And more recently, in 2015, it has reached 106 million tons. Let us look at our capture fisheries. If we look at uh, the 1950s, th there is about 20 million tons of uh, capture fisheries being produced. Uh, this continues to grow in 1970 and 1985 to about 8 million tons. And in 1995, if you look at the numbers between 1995 and uh, more recently in 2013, 2015, it remained stable. It fluctuated a, li a little bit, but it remained stable at around 90 million tons in total production. When we put these two graphs together, we are looking at the difference in trends in the past 60, 65 years in aquaculture and fisheries global production. In the 1950s, you can clearly see there is a big difference in production with aquaculture being at a minimal point of production. By 1985, aquaculture has reached 11 million metric tons. Fisheries is way ahead in production at 79 million metric tons. Aquaculture, the general trend, is a sharp rise and increase in production, whereas fisheries has a more stable production since 1995, coming up to two years ago. They have remained at about 93, 94, 93 million metric tons in the past decade or so, while aquaculture has continually risen and now presently surpasses fisheries production. Let us look at this from a different perspective. In the year 2000, aquaculture production was 42 million metric tons, which is about 31% of total global production, whereas fisheries was 96%, representing 95 million metric tons. In 2015, aquaculture has reached 106 million metric tons, and fisheries has remained stable for a few years now at about 90 million metric tons. So let us define aquaculture. To help us define aquaculture, we're going to review a few key concepts. The first one that I'd like to present is ownership. There is ownership during seed stock production, during rearing, and during harvesting. The concept of accountability, environmental stewardship, tracing the product from the source to the table, and ethical and moral responsibilities. Business. Aquaculture is a business. It involves marketing, sales, consumers, profit, loss. The following interview, we will see this being illustrated by the seafood manager at Kroger in Frankfort, Kentucky. This interview shows the impact that international production of tilapia has on global consumption in Frankfort, Kentucky. And this mindset, this idea, this perspective is true throughout the world. Aquaculture is a global and international activity, and we see that trend continuing in the future. In the following video, the seafood manager at Kroger introduces himself he talks about the tilapia, the safety, the quality, and product traceability of the product. How you doing? My name is Andrew Gaskins. I'm the seafood manager here at the Frankfurt East Kroger in Frankfurt, Kentucky. And we're here to talk about fish today. <laughs> Andrew, uh, so can you tell me about the bit, tell us about the business aspects of aquaculture uh, and, and specifically of tilapia here? Absolutely. Yes. Um, tilapia is actually one of the most popular fish that we currently offer. It's a very inexpensive, very easily renewable resource. Um, 
we sell tons of it every week as it is one of the more popular fish we have. Um, Where does it come from? Tilapia comes from a number of places. Mostly it is a Central American fish. Most of our tilapia is coming out of Honduras or Costa Rica, um, but mainly Central America at different, different farms that meet Kroger standards for quality and freshness and they want to give us the best possible product that we can present to the public. Tell us about the FDA and the regulations that, uh, and, and things that you do to ensure uh, that you know the quality of the product and where it comes from. Okay, um, the FDA requires quite a bit when it comes to any sort of food, real, really, but with tilapia and with seafood in general, there's a few things that are very, very important. One, from the time it's harvested, it has a specific amount of time where it needs to get into the stores so it can be presented to the people in the public to buy. Um, once we receive the product, we have approximately two to three days to sell that product. The reality of it though is if you're merchandising it properly and you're promoting it properly, that fish is there for one day. It's fresh, it's presented to the public, and it's out of the building so that there's no chance of A, uh, contamination or illness happening because once fish has been out for a certain period of time, it has a high chance that it can become infected or it can promote uh, disease or germs. So in order to prevent that, we keep a very close log on how long that fish is there. For it to be shipped in, it comes in with a specific date coding. It lets us know when that fish was harvested. It also lets us know uh, when that fish was shipped out, where the fish is from, as well as what company may, uh, is uh, producing that fish for us. Um, with those aspects, if there is a problem somewhere down the road or if something does get contaminated, it allows not only the company but the FDA to track back to the source of where this came from and determine where the problem occurred. Was not exposure to heat? Because one of the big things is with any seafood, you have to keep it cold. So our seafood comes in packed on ice. It is, uh, has to be cold. The bottom line is if I open up a box of our fish and it has either an odor or it is uh, discolored in some sort of way where you would not want to consume it, we don't even present it to the public for, for consum consumption. So how have your sales of tilapia been this week? Uh, this week has been very, very good. We're actually currently waiting on our next shipment because we sold out of what we had over the course of the weekend because it was just, it was on sale. Uh, tilapia retail wise, we put it on sale for around $3.99. Normally it's about $6 a pound. Um, so as you can imagine, we went through quite a bit this week. So you sold out all of your fresh and uniced tilapia that was flown in from Honduras. Correct. But what do you have right now that, that, that you're selling? Actually we have what's a new program for us. These are breathable skin packs. The new technology allows it to be, uh, the fish to be packaged right at the factory and sent in to us in this form. And the beautiful thing about this is two things. One, it gives us an extended shelf life for this fish, meaning that you get a fresher fish and there's a reduced chance of uh, contamination because this has been packaged, it's sealed into a breathable skin pack where it still is allowed to have a little bit of air that gets to it through the skin to keep it fresh, but at the same time, it's not turning it bad. It also has a specific date on it. We keep these only up until that date. If you see it in the stores and it has any of our markdown stickers on it, it means it's within two days of going away. Once it hits that date, it's not out there on the shelf. <laughs> now that we have seen the business aspect of tilapia aquaculture, let us take a, a time out and take out your pens and papers, please. Let's do some brainstorming. So here, let's think about the word farming. Just take a second and write down any word that comes to your mind when you think about farming. Here are a few examples. Machinery, land, water resources. Maybe you have something like feeding people. Anything is valid in a brainstorm session. Another major aspect of aquaculture is a form of intervention. For example, to increase control over productivity and the biology of the animals, we use different production systems. We want to increase control of reproduction. We want to formulate feeds that are specific to each of the species that we culture. And finally, aquaculture involves the farming of aquatic organisms. This includes fish, mollusks, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. So it is important to know that aquaculture is not only about fish. It's not only about shrimp. It's multiple species, 567 species that are being produced in the world through aquaculture.
One of the main types of aquatic organisms that are cultured in the world are aquatic plants. In this case, you are seeing a woman in a seaweed farm. This type of seaweed is used in food and cosmetic industries. As part of your experience in learning the definition of aquaculture, uh, I would like to recommend that you visit this website that is highlighted. Once you direct yourself to the website, you will see this page and there is a two minute video that shows how seaweed production is addressing fisheries decline in Madagascar. Another major aquatic organism cultured in global aquaculture are crustaceans. In this case, you see a freshwater prawn. This is a female. The orange area it represents the eggs that she is holding. This is a picture of a male freshwater prawn here in Kentucky, USA. And this represents a harvest of freshwater prawn in Bangladesh. Another example of a crustacean that is commonly cultured in the world, including Frankfort, Kentucky, is the white leg shrimp. In this picture, you can see a seine being pulled by men in harvesting shrimp at a shrimp farm in Placencia, Belize. If you'd like to learn more about shrimp farming and environmental stewardship in Belize, please use one of these websites for which we provide the links. So this first website is looking at a video on Belize's shrimp farming industry's journey toward a certification. And the second link tells us a little bit about the fishing and aquaculture industry in Belize. Mollusks represent another major aquaculture product of the world. In this picture, you see a Japanese scallop and here are lantern type nets that are suspended and you can see the different layers within the net holding the scallop. Fish are a major part of world aquaculture production. In the channel catfish, Ictilarus punctatus, is, is actually grown all over the world. These are just some examples of the countries that produce them. This is a major product of the U.S., uh, but it is also cultured in Central America and in Asia. In this picture, channel catfish are being harvested at America's Catch Incorporated in Mississippi. The following links give us more information about channel catfish production in the U.S. So if you click on that first link, it will take you to the United States Department of Agriculture. And here you can see the most recent information on channel catfish production in 2018. The second link gives you some general information on U.S. aquaculture. The Nile tilapia is another example of a world aquaculture species. This is a tilapia hatchery at Louisiana Specialty Aqua Farm in Robert, Louisiana. So my question to you today watching us is, what is a tilapia? Is it one kind of fish? Uh, many different kinds of fish? Where does it come from? Join me in thinking about the definition of tilapia and consider which of the following statements are true or false. True or false. All fish called tilapia are biologically the same. Tilapia refers to a group of freshwater fish. Tilapia refers to many species. Tilapia refers to one species of fish. Tilapia refers to a group of marine fish. Tilapia originate from Jordan, Israel, and the African continent. Three statements were false. The first statement, tilapia are biologically the same, is false. Tilapia refers to one species of fish, is false. And tilapia refers to a group of marine fish, is false. Actually, tilapia refers to a group of freshwater fish that include more than 70 species and they originate from Jordan, Israel, and the African continent. The term tilapia is commonly used as a generic name for a group of freshwater fishes from the Middle East, specifically Jordan and Israel, and the African continent. There are 76 known species of this group of cichlids that consist of three genera. 
The word tilapia is also a scientific term used in this biological classification. The genus tilapia are known for their reproductive behavior. They are nest guarders, which means that the male and the females release their gametes and the eggs lay on a substrate, they stay there in the external environment. The genus Satterodon are known to be mouth brooders. In this case, both the male and female hold the eggs for incubation in their mouth after fertilization. And finally, the genus Oreochromis. In this genus, the mouth brooders are only the females. They are the ones that guard the eggs and the fry in their mouth until the fry are ready to leave and are safe. Global tilapia aquaculture includes 12 species of commercial importance that come from these three genera. They also include one hybrid and they include a group of tilapia species that are unidentified. Two species come from Satterodon genus, two species come from the tilapia genus. The remaining species of commercial importance are all in the Oreochromis genus. The Nile tilapia, Oreochromis niloticus, is the fourth most cultured fish species in global aquaculture after three carp species. This means that it is of major importance in world aquaculture. Let us look a little bit more closely at the external anatomy of Nile tilapia. The, the dorsal fin is divided into the spinous part which is more at the front or the anterior portion of the fin and the soft rays which are in the posterior portion of the fin. One special feature of Nile tilapia is the banding pattern on the caudal fin. This distinguishes it from other species of tilapia. Dark bars form vertical bands that you can see on the picture with the outline over here going from top to bottom, you see the shades of dark and then the shades of light. The pectoral fin. There is a hard spine on the pelvic fin and on the anal fin. So when you're handling tilapia, you want to be careful of these spines. Let's have a short video activity on two additional external features of tilapia. Uh, you have the Upper column. Upper column, which is a facial structure that offers protection for the gills. So you can see the gills in here. It it is a structure that helps also with res it is a structure that helps with respiration and it protects the gills as well. Next you have the lateral line. The lateral line in tilapia is broken. So maybe you can see it with the camera right here. You, it goes right along the side of the fish. It ends here and then it begins right along here and continues towards the end. So it's here and it's here. Caroline, what does the lateral line do? The lateral line helps the fish detect movement, vibrations, water depth, and water pressure. Thanks. What is global tilapia production? In order to define that, let us think about this. Do you know how many countries there are in the world? There are 204 countries in the world reported by the U.S. Department of State. How many of these are tilapia producers? 131 countries based on our FAO data. And how many of these produce Nile tilapia? 84 countries. So we can state that the majority of the world is producing tilapia and that many of those producers are specifically producing Nile tilapia. What is tilapia production in the US? In the early 1980s, there was very minimal or no tilapia production. In 1989 to 1990, you see a dramatic increase from almost no production to 2,000 tons of tilapia. The species of tilapia 
is under the category and the FAO data as tilapia ne, which is ne means not elsewhere included. And it basically just states that the tilapia species are unspecified. This production of US tilapia continues to increase dramatically from 1990 to 2002, reaching 9,000 tons. This production for the next few years remains about the same. And in 2015, production is 8,618 tons. Let us go back to global tilapia production. This global tilapia production is represented by 12 species from three genera. One hybrid, which is a hybrid between two species of Oreochromis, and one category of unnamed species. Global tilapia production in the 1950s was very similar to the US in the 1980s. It was very minimal. However, in 1980, we can see that there is an increase to 107,000 tons. By 1999, global tilapia production has risen to 1.2 million tons. And in 2015, global production is now 5.7 million tons. When we overlay the Nile tilapia data on global production, we can clearly see that Nile tilapia is increasing alongside the remaining commercial species in total aquaculture production of tilapia. Nile tilapia production has reached 3.9 million tons by 2015. Let's look at this global production in terms of the dollar value. This is the farm gate value of the tilapia produced in the world. In 1997, the total tilapia value in US dollars was $1.2 billion. In 2007, this value increased to $3.6, $3.7 billion. And more currently, in 2015, this value has now reached $8.9 billion. The value of Nile tilapia also shows the importance of this species in tilapia aquaculture. In 2015, this value was $6 billion. Out of the total $8.9 billion, that reflects total production of tilapia. Why tilapia? What are the aquaculture attributes that make this fish popular and important at a global scale? There is a high demand worldwide and in the US. Tilapia has a high palatability and versatility in cooking and flavor. Biologically, they grow fast. They have high environmental tolerance. They have a wide range of tolerance for water quality, such as the temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. They are hardy when you're handling them. They are resistant to disease and to stress. And it is also beneficial that we have the ability to reproduce them in captivity. They can breed year round and they have a two to three week spawning cycle. Another important aspect is acceptance of feed after yolk sac absorption. So by now we should be having a picture of what tilapia aquaculture is. Tilapia aquaculture is multidimensional and this parallels all aquaculture production in the world. It involves biology, reproduction, water quality, and genetics. It involves innovation, technology development, and research. It involves routine feeding, formulation of feeds, fish handling, culture systems, it also involves environmental and ethical standards, animal care, responsible environmental stewardship, regulations, permits. It involves writing, record keeping, planning, math, business, economics, marketing, sales, and it involves people, relationship between people, between farm, between nations, policies that are established. It involves employment. 
So you can see that aquaculture and tilapia aquaculture is multidimensional, it is multidisciplinary. You have already heard about the business aspect of tilapia aquaculture from our Kroger Seafood Manager. In the following sections, we will be looking at reproduction, feeding, and specifically at the recirculating aquaculture system, which is commonly used in the United States. Nile tilapia start maturing at about 10 to 12 months in East African lakes. The size at maturation is between 3 fourths to 1 pound, or about 350 to 500 grams. However, in an aquaculture situation, such as a farm pond, the size at maturation can be 5 to 6 months, and they can start producing eggs and reproducing at 1 to 7 ounces, or 20 to 200 grams. So we are talking about very small fish with the ability to reproduce. This is actually a huge problem in mixed sex production. Mixed sex production that includes both male and female have an inherent weakness. There will be uncontrolled reproduction because of the presence of the females. There will be completing of resources. Sometimes as much as 70% of the fish that are harvested are offspring. They have a highly variable size at the end of the growing season, and they may be stunted and unmarketable. So these are problems that are associated with mixed sex production. What is the solution? Well, biologically, the males grow faster and larger than the females. So the solution that was proposed was to produce all males and to have all males production. There are four major types of all male production. The first one is a very basic technology that involves manual sorting. This includes the visual inspection of the female and male anatomy. The female has the anal opening, the genital pore, and the urinary pore. And the male has the anal opening and the urogenital pore only. The second technology used in all male production is hybridization. It is possible, depending on which species you cross, to produce all male offspring. In this case, you see the Oreochromis niloticus male is crossed with the Oreochromis aureus female, fish from two different species. The resulting offspring varies from 75 to 95% male. Another hybrid that can be performed is by using the Oreochromis honororum and the Oreochromis nilocticus fish. In this case, it is reported that there is 100% male offspring. However, there are many problems associated with hybridization in terms of the integrity of the species being crossed, the genetic constitution, and also the variability in the resulting males, the percentage of males that is produced. A third method of all male production is the use of metal testosterone. This is a hormone that is applied at the fry stage. When the fish start feeding, they can be fed this in the first few days, and this ensures that the majority of the females, a very high percentage, are male. In the US, you cannot do this unless you have a special authorization for the use of an investigative new animal drug, the INAD 11-236. Actually, ongoing concerns are the environmental impact and the product manufacturing stability, the sources of this product. It costs $700 a year. And last year, there were about 8 to 15 participating facilities. The fourth method of producing all male offspring is by use of YY male broodstock technology. Males and females in Nile tilapia are normally defined by X and Y chromosomes. Males have X and a Y chromosome, and the female has two X chromosomes. 
when these are crossed, that is when these are mated, in general, it, this results in 50% male and 50% female. However, if we use a broodstock male that has two Y chromosomes and we cross it with a female that normally has two X chromosomes, we should get all male progeny with an X and a Y chromosome. These YY males are produced by two companies in the world. One of them is Tilakwa International in the Netherlands and the other is Fish Gen Limited in Wales, UK. Louisiana Specialty Aqua Farm is the only large-scale commercial tilapia hatchery that I know of in the US that makes use of the YY male technology. In this picture, you can see Eider, who helps in the routine maintenance and works with the broodstock, collecting females to check for fry and eggs. This the device on the image, on the picture, is a contraption that he created with PVC pipes and some netting, and he pulls it towards him to capture the females, corral them in one area. Here we see either inventing a method for corralling the fish with minimal stress and ease of handling, where he can dip them out individually and check each one of them for eggs, which are then put into an incubation system. There are five factors that affect reproduction. I would like you to consider and to remember one of the most important factors is temperature. For tilapia, for night tilapia, the optimal temperature range is between 77 to 86. Personally, I like to keep that temperature at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. They will not reproduce at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. They stop feeding at 63 degrees Fahrenheit and they die between 48 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit. A second important factor affecting reproduction in fish, and in this case tilapia, is photoperiod. In our experiments and spawning of tilapia, we used an automated lighting system that provided 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. A third major aspect of reproduction is feeding your fish with adequate nutrition. For tilapia, these diets are commercially available. The age of the broodstock is also very important. If they are too young, you cannot use them, they, will, they are not ovulating yet. If they are about eight months, nine months, one year, a year and a half, these are younger fish and you can get more eggs, but these eggs are a little bit smaller than the older females, which are five, six, seven year old, that produce larger but fewer eggs. Another main consideration in reproduction of tilapia is their genetic makeup. In the beginning, when tilapia were exported from Africa into the rest of the world for global production, there were six sites that were the initial sources. One was from Egypt, the other Sudan, Uganda, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast. This represents a small founder population and if you start breeding fish that are too similar to each other genetically, you run into problems of inbreeding depression. This, for example, means that the fish would have deformities or they would die. They are not able to survive or they're not able to grow as well. So the genetic makeup is very important. At Kentucky State University, our tilapia project is on the crossbreeding and genetic sex regulation for development of fast-growing all-male tilapia. What does this mean? Well, this means that we're using the YY technology, males with two Y chromosomes, and crossing them with different strains of females. In this example, you see a dark pigmented YY male and a red YY male. These are crossed with, for example, Ismaeli Canal and another example of a different strain that has been worked on genetically is the genetically improved farm tilapia. One of the main objectives 
is to look at how many males are produced by these crosses. So we look at sex segregation and we are able to identify the male and female morphology and get data on percentage of males in each offspring. We're also looking at color inheritance of red and dark fish that are crossed. Red fish are important for their color because some customers prefer this pigmentation over the dark. We are studying the genetic variability of the parents and we have performed research on growth comparison of four different crosses. This means that we have spawned the male and female broodstock, collected the eggs and fed them from fry up to about 20 grams at which point we stacked an experimental system with four crosses and compared the growth of each of those four groups. These are the spawning systems that we used. They are composed of one tank, one biofilter, one pump. We have air and we have a means of controlling the temperature and the light that the fish are getting. These spawning systems were stacked at a ratio of one YY male to three normal females. Each of these females had two X chromosomes. Every two weeks, we checked each of the females individually by opening their mouths and looking inside for either eggs or fry. Remember that Nile tilapia females are going to hold those eggs immediately after fertilization. So they release the eggs, the males fertilize the eggs, and the females immediately incubate those eggs in their mouth. Once we collect the eggs, we put them in an incubation system. In this picture, you can see what we call a McDonald jar that holds the eggs and the fry that we collect. This is used in research and in commercial scale aquaculture. Once the sack fry hatch, they swim up the McDonald jars and enter the recirculating system that we have prepared for them in this case. Immediately after absorbing their yolk sac, they are able to consume feed. So this picture shows an uh, automated uh, feeder that was set to feed three times a day and we manually fed them two or three more additional times during the day. At these early stages, it is important to feed these fish about every two to three hours. This is another example of the fry rearing systems. Once we fed them for one or two weeks, we moved them to this system. And you can see the fry in the individual tank here. After initial feeding, we place the fry in this six tank recirculating aquaculture system. Each of these tanks was 100 gallons per tank. Once the fry reached about 20 grams, then we placed them in a 12 tank recirculating aquaculture system. Each of these tanks were 250 gallons and each tank was stacked with about 50 fish. So throughout this process, one of the most important parts of aquaculture and in our experiment was feeding them. The question is, how much do you feed tilapia? There are actually very specific feeding guidelines that are provided and commercially available. One of them, for example, is the Cargill tilapia feeding guideline. So remember, I was saying that when they start to feed, they just absorb their yolk sac. The fry are really small, about 0.1 grams. During this stage, we are feeding them a powdered feed that is about 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters and they recommend eight feedings a day. Once the fry reach about one to five grams, you're feeding them a slightly larger feed, 0 0.6 to eight millimeters, and you're feeding them about six feedings per day. And as the fry grow, they have very specific recommendations of the feed sizes and the size range of the fish that you will be feeding that, that particular pellet size. This feeding chart I included to illustrate another set of recommendations 
for how to feed tilapia as they grow. On this column, you see the size of the fish that you're feeding. And based on this size, you can go to the size of the pellets that you're using. So for example, if your fish are about one gram, they are recommending to use 0 0.6 to one millimeter feed. If your fish are about 300 gram, they are recommending for you to use 4.8 millimeter size feed. Now this daily feeding rate is based on the percent biomass that you will calculate of the fish that you have at a particular time during your grow out of your tilapia. But actually, so you can get this in black and white and very specifically the size of fish, the size of feed and how much you should feed them every day. But you have to remember that this is only a guide. Actually, it is very important for you to make your own decisions on which size to feed, the quantity of feed you're giving them based on one, you use the guides that are available to you. But also very importantly, as both Cargill and the other company Rangin suggests, is that you pay close attention to your fish, to your dissolved oxygen, to your temperature, to your water quality in the recirculating aquaculture system, and the amount of fish that you're feeding, the weight of the fish, and that you adjust the feed, the feed size, the amount that you're feeding, based on all this. So it's not simply going down a chart. It is a very dynamic process. You're observing your fish while they're eating, and you're making changes as they grow. You're making changes based on the water quality. And this holistic approach will enable you to grow your tilapia properly and in a safe manner within your own recirculating system. So just to reiterate that, Rangan suggests that, yes, they provide a feeding guide, but it is just a guide that the actual rates you should adjust and that you should consider water temperature, fish density, water quality, and fish feeding behavior. So let us look at what we do here at Kentucky State University with regards to feed. We will be illustrating the feed we use and the feed sizes for different stages. Hello, good morning. In this session, we're going to talk about the different size feed for tilapia. Now, one of the greatest advantages of uh, culturing tilapia as an aquaculture species is it's ready and ease, ease of uptake of feed. So after the absorption of the yolk sac, uh, when they become hungry, you can start actually giving them manufactured feed. Now, the, there are different sizes of manufactured feed. They range from 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeters, up to 4.8 millimeters. Tilapia, once they absorb their yolk sac, are able to eat the very fine feed. This size is about 0.3 millimeters and it's fed to about one gram fish. You can see here, they are sold in 50 pound bags and each one is one type of, uh, one size of feed. So the second size here is a little bit more grainy. It is 0.68 millimeters and it's fed to one to five gram fish. Actually today, Caroline is going to feed fish that are about more or less uh, 20 grams and uh, five to 20 gram fish. We feed 1.5 millimeters and we also have the 2.2 millimeter feed. So she will be using the 2.2 to feed uh, about 20 gram fish. The other two feed sizes uh, will be used by Caroline to feed fish that are 20 to 150 grams. This size feed is uh, 3.2 millimeters. And finally, 4.8 millimeter size feed is used to feed larger fish, adult fish, uh, anywhere from above 150 grams to 450 grams or larger. What are some recommendations for you when you're feeding? First, spread the feed evenly around the surface area of the water. 
if you just go and quickly put the feed in one corner, first of all, that does not give you time to observe the fish. Secondly, it puts the feed in one area where the more aggressive fish are likely to eat more than other fish. So you want to spread that feed. Secondly, observe your fish. Thirdly, observe your system. Another thing that you need to do is to sample your fish every three weeks, four weeks, to look at their growth and adjust the feeding rates as they grow. It is okay if you sample maybe 20 fish or 10 fish. Just go in and try to get some random sample, take out the weight, and then you can calculate the myomass based on that. Okay, so Caroline will feed uh, fish that are about 20 grams with 2.2 millimeter. Notice how she spreads the feed all around the tank and uh, you see the fish are very active. It's a sure indicator of uh, their health. If you see that they're slow or they're not eating the feed, then something is wrong. So Caroline, what size fish uh, feed is this? This is a 3.2 size millimeter. Okay, good. So we'll go ahead and feed the tank. Let's see. So once again, notice how Caroline is moving around the tank and providing uh, as much feed covering the whole tank, all the area. If the problem is, if you put it only in one area, then uh, the tougher, the bigger fish are gonna fight for that feed and gonna eat most of it. But if you spread the feed around, then uh, each fish has an opportunity to eat that feed. So we're feeding 4.8 millimeter feed to broodstock tilapia. So, one of the things that you want to do when you're feeding is actually you give a little bit of the feed and uh, you, you observe the fish for them to eat. If you throw in all the feed at once, maybe you give them too much feed. So uh, at the beginning, you just give a little bit. You see how they're eating, you can give them more. So you see how they started eating a little bit more? The feed is spread out. Caroline will continue giving them a little bit more feed. Let us now talk about recirculating aquaculture systems. So in order to understand your fish and their culture environment, it's important for you to know the main components of that culture environment. The main components of a recirculating aquaculture system are some sort of filtration for the nitrification process in which total ammonia nitrogen is converted to nitrite and nitrate. You also need a filter for solids removal. Your culture units, which, are the which can be the tanks. A pump to provide water circulation, electricity for the pump, water and water flow plumbing that connects the entire system, and air, dissolved oxygen for the fish. Without this, the fish will not survive. Let us look at a video illustration of the basic components of a recirculating aquaculture system. So, Caroline, not in any order of importance, but what is one of the main components of a recirculating system? You have to have a biofilter for sure. Okay, good. So, which one is the biofilter here? This one. Okay. So, the biofilter uh, provides substrate for bacteria to grow in that uh, reduce the toxicity of the water from the ammonia being produced from uh, total ammonia nitrogen to nitrite to nitrate. What's another uh, component? Uh, you have to have a filter that removes the solids. In this system, we have a solids removal filter. This filter is designed to take out uh, the accumulation of solids and you move it between filter mode. You can go to backwash, which is removing the solids as we speak. Then you go to rinse, 
to further remove some solids and you go back to the filter mode. This is probably the type of filter that you will have in your school. Tell me more about recirculating aquaculture systems. You have a sub tank, which is where the water goes before it goes into the filters. Yes. Caroline, what's related to electricity that's a main component of water flow in the system? You have to have a pump that pumps the water. Exactly. So the pump actually provides a flow of water. It goes from the collection area, which is the sump, it goes into the solids, the biofil solids filter in this case. Then it uh, goes into the biofilter. And finally, it goes into each individual tanks. Now, when you are maintaining your tank, actually having seeing the flow of water is very important. If you don't see flow of water, then this water will become low in oxygen. It will become very turbid and dark, and lots of sediments will be in here not good for your fish. So, a key component other than uh, your, your pump, uh, your biofilter, is also ensuring every time that there is water flow in each tank. What, what else, Caroline? You have to have oxygen. So this is very important for the fish. Every tank should have oxygen. So just to review, the main components of a recirculating system will be some sort of filter that removes solids, provides biofiltration, you have a source of electricity, you have a pump, uh, you have air going into the systems, and you, you have a pipe uh, system that connects all the tanks to the sump, the biofilter, and the motor of the pump. Thank you. Some of the things that you want to keep in mind in maintaining your recirculating aquaculture system is one, ensure adequate water flow into each of the tanks. Make sure that there is water flow. Ensure that your air supply is constant. If there is a problem, figure out what the source of the problem is and fix it. Constantly monitor your water quality. Know your fish, observe them. If you're feeding them every day, you will get to know your fish. And if you're feeding them and you see that they're not eating, then you need to ask yourself why, if they should be eating at the time you feed them. It's also very important to communicate what you're doing with your system. So for the high school teachers, you assign to a particular student feeding. Was the feeding done, yes or no? How does the teacher know that this was done? If more than one student is feeding the system, they need to communicate between each other and make sure that the teacher knows what they are doing to ensure that the feeding process is constant and routine. Here are some recommendations from the high school students that work with us to you. So Caroline, first of all, thank you very much for helping me with this video lecture. Uh, you and Gage have been invaluable help throughout their time here. Um, Tell me, if uh, other high school students are going to work with recirculating systems, what do you have to say to them about it? One of the most helpful things is having a stable routine when it comes to backwashing and feeding, and that makes your tanks reliable and steady. What uh, are some potential problems that uh, you might face during uh, maintenance of a recirculating system? Uh, there are many different problems, like overfeeding and not backwashing. Not backwashing can make your water flow weak, and overfeeding can clog up your system. Thank you very much, Carla. Let us now summarize what we are able to do at the end of this lecture, what I hope that you are taking away with you at the end of this lecture. First of all, you should be able to define aquaculture, list the key aquaculture definition concepts and terms, Talk about tilapia aquaculture, the international and the local aspects of that. Understand that aquaculture is a business and has an immediate impact on our lives. Define the commonly used term tilapia. Identify the most cultured tilapia species. 
list four categories of aquatic organisms in global aquaculture, a general understanding of Nile tilapia production, and we should now be able to list the main components of a recirculating aquaculture system. So I would like to acknowledge actually uh, Louisiana Specialty Aqua Farms, uh, Doug Cuenz, who, whom we visited and allowed us to use the pictures in this presentation, Dr. David Erdhal, who gave us some information on the use of metal testosterone in the US, and the project director of our tilapia project at KSU, Dr. Boris Gomelsky. Thank you very much for accompanying me today in this tilapia video lecture. And if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. You can see my contact information in a second.